Too Close to Call is a sports talk radio show brought to you by Kevin Mahalik, featuring commentary on the week's biggest sports news and events and engaging behind-the-scenes player interviews. While specializing in Philadelphia sports, Too Close to Call will also discuss issues and events happening on a national scale. Too Close to Call airs Tuesday from 1 to 2 p.m. and Saturday and Sunday from 8 to 9 a.m. Aloha and hello out there, everybody. What's going on? This is Kevin Mahalik, your host of Too Close to Call, the sports talk radio show here on Usula Radio at Usula Media. It is just after 1 o'clock on Tuesday, September 24th, and I appreciate you guys listening in. Once again, I do apologize. We're not going to have any video today up on Facebook. We are only going to be available via audio on usulamedia.com, but you already knew that since that's where you're listening to us. But if you could do me a favor, pick up your phones and um, head to the home screen, head to the Instagram app, and... Type in Usula Radio and Usula Media into the search bar, and that is USALA Radio and USALA Media. While you're doing that, after you give those guys a follow and check that out, go to the same search bar and type in Too Close to Call. That's the number two both times. And you will find the Too Close to Call sports page that you guys can follow along where we'll post videos from the sporting events over the weekend or during the week or the recent videos online that are making their way around that everybody seems to find entertaining. But as well as on there is a link to our podcast subscription that we do outside of this radio show here every week on Usula Radio. But uh, if you could do that, follow Usula, follow Too Close to Call, follow myself at kmiho20, that's K-M-I-H-O, the number two and the number zero on Instagram. I'd love to interact with you guys. I'd love to hear some comments on the show, some feedback, some ratings to let me know what uh, you guys really want to hear. And along those lines, we'll, uh, we'll start with a little bit of housekeeping on today's episode here of Too Close to Call. And with the recent format change and us now coming to you guys three times a week, what I've decided to do is on Saturdays and Sundays, make those episodes new individual episodes. So good news for all you listeners out there. You won't have to hear the repeat of Tuesday's episodes once again on the weekends. You'll be able to hear all new episodes. So what we're going to do in that instance, uh, you know, I say we because I like to involve you guys, the listeners, as part of the show. I think of this as one big community. So instead of saying I all the time, I like to say we because I want to know you guys are involved in this as well. So let me know if you think this is a good idea. But based on initial feedback, I think uh, the reactions are going to be very positive. But Saturday's show will now be a strictly college football show. I had been taking the Tuesday episodes, kind of breaking it down into half Philadelphia, half national, and obviously it being September and football season. College and professional football dictated most of that time, but with episodes now Saturday and Sunday morning, I figured we'll bring you guys relevant content for that day, and from 8 to 9 a.m., we'll talk college football. It'll be a little pre-college game day for you listeners out there who like to get things done on the weekends, and then Sunday from 8 to 9 again, we'll talk NFL, we'll talk Eagles, we'll talk the rest of the league. I'll get you guys set for your fantasy football lineups. I'll let you know who I'm thinking about playing or the decisions I'm making and we'll break it down like that because it will bring you relevant up-to-date information on every single episode and you guys will no longer have to listen to replays and you'll have up-to-date information on every one of those so I hope you guys will like the new format I really think you're going to and because of the college football and NFL talks on the weekends that will make our Tuesday episode aka this episode our Philadelphia sports talk hour where we'll dive into all four Philadelphia sports teams and and see what's going on there and obviously Obviously, this first segment, it'll be our Philadelphia Eagles recap and preview. It'll be our longest segment because, boy, oh, boy, do we have a lot to talk about. And this Eagles team just continues to frustrate the heck out of its fans. We knew going into this game that we were going to be shorthanded once again with some of the injuries. The reports were that Deshaun Jackson was going to be out with an injury a couple of weeks, so there really wasn't hope that he was going to play, but 
there was a, a bit of a glimmer for Alshon Jeffrey, Dallas Goddard, and, and everybody else who was kind of banged up from last week's game. And ultimately, Jeffrey could not give it a go, but Goddard decided to dress and play. He didn't play a ton of snaps, but he uh, he did make his presence known later in the game in a negative way, but we'll get to that. So let's kind of run through the recap, go through the game breakdown. I have a couple of different times where we'll stop, and I'll go on a bit of a tangent talking about the Eagles, but uh, overall, just not a great effort against the Lions. To start the game, however, the Eagles got the ball and actually drove right down the field and kicked a field goal. It was the team's best opening drive of the year. They had only been averaging, I think it was three points in the entire first quarter, and they were able to match that on their first drive with Wentz taking him down the field and hitting a big play to Miles Sanders, who lined up more on the outside in a receiver position in this game than in weeks past and I think we may see a little bit more of that going forward as they try to turn him into more of an all-around back and not just a uh, first and second down option for the team but right after that right back the Eagles go down opening drive get a field goal we're feeling good we scored some points hopefully we're not going to be behind all game and boom Next kickoff, the Eagles kick it short because I guess they like to pin the team back and don't like to just bang it through the end zone like Jake Elliott did for the rest of the game. And what's that? A hundred yard kickoff return to the house. It's just, it's unacceptable for Eagles special teams to come out after the offense goes right down the field, gets a field goal, and to give up a kickoff return touchdown like that it just it can't happen and and it's just more discipline when it comes to special teams and staying in your lanes and and knowing your job and not over committing to moves or working around blocks but staying once again where you're supposed to it just oh god it was crushing it was crushing early in the game However, after that, the Eagles offense comes right back on the field and has one of their best drives of the early season. It was the run game early on. Jordan Howard finally got some opportunities to run the ball. He was able to get behind extra offensive linemen and find some room as they move the ball down the field and really got committed to the run. And this was something that we had been complaining about as Eagles fans for multiple weeks was the fact that Doug wasn't willing to run the football and or everybody's been clamoring for more Jordan Howard because when he would, he gets in the game and he runs hard, he seems to fall forward almost every time. You don't see a lot of negative plays when he touches the football because he's been around for a few years. He understands the concept of three yards in a cloud of dust, you know, finishing forward, keeping you ahead of the chains, keeping you in manageable downs and distances. And especially when you're missing your weapons on the outside, your entire offense is almost predicated on staying on time and staying in front of the chains, and that's what they were able to do in this drive. And later in the drive, Carson Wentz makes a play with a scramble all the way down to the one, and then Jordan Howard caps off the drive with a one-yard touchdown and look at that the Eagles offense scores 10 points in the first quarter we haven't seen this in years and as an Eagles fan you got to be feeling good about yourself you're going okay our offense has had the ball twice and we've scored 10 points they've had one kickoff return so our defense hasn't been on the field yet but obviously as an offense we like where we're at what we just did worked why don't we maintain that game plan and continue to see what happens the next drive, the Lions' first drive with the football, it really showed you what the game plan was going to be for the Detroit Lions. On their first drive, they attacked Ronald Darby four separate times and completed every pass. And this is becoming a pattern when it comes to Ronald Darby. The Atlanta Falcons went after him numerous times last week. We all saw him get beat at least three times. Only one of them was connected for a touchdown, but none of these were deep balls. But it was four for four on the first drive, and it was clear as day that they were attacking Ronald Darby. And this spells a little bit of issues for the Eagles because the Eagles see Darby as their best corner. I know he's coming off an ACL injury. And that's probably why 
He's not at 100% yet, but the Eagles brought him back on a one-year prove-it deal for a decent amount of money. I think it was 8 to $10 million, which is starting cornerback money in the NFL, and, and Darby has not lived up to that contract, and he is playing himself out of a bunch of money this offseason because you're thinking to yourself, Jalen Mills is out. They got Razul Douglas or Sidney Jones or Avante Maddox on the other side, all people who have problems or issues in the past, but... The other teams are looking at the film and deciding that Ronald Darby is the guy they want to attack, and they've had success with it. And Jim Swartz's defense, where he likes to play a lot of man-to-man, that's not a good sign going forward. That means Ronald Darby, as one of the Eagles' best corners, is going to be on the other team's best receiver oftentimes. And and if he's having trouble, it's going to be a long day for the defense. But with all of this said, they had... The Lions with a third and goal from the six-inch line, and the Lions decided to run a pass-play fade that didn't work. However, the Eagles lined up offsides on the play. Not a lot of people are talking about this play, but an early play that obviously then led to a touchdown, which is a difference of four points in a three-point ball game. but you can't line up offsides. I understand you're trying to get as close as you can because you're thinking it's probably a QB sneak or a dive up the middle, but it wasn't the fact that he was drawn offsides. He just lined up in the neutral zone. I forget who it was, and I think it may have been Ridgeway on the inside or, or Spence, uh, I think, but I don't know exactly. Either way, unacceptable, whoever that was. And This led to a touchdown to make it 14 to 10 Lions. And honestly, I thought it was one of the biggest drives of the game because like I mentioned, your offense was feeling good. They put up 10 early points, haven't scored a lot in the first quarter in the past. And then all of a sudden you're staring up and you're still down 14 to 10. So we've done everything right on the offensive side of the football, even with all of these injuries. And we're still down four points as we get into the second quarter. So the offense then gets the ball back. They advance it a little bit and then we get one of the Mac Hollins offensive pass interference calls and there were three offensive pass interference calls made all throughout the day and honestly I thought this one was the worst of the bunch because yeah there was a little bit of hand fighting maybe he pushed off but it was not egregious to the point where they needed to make this call and even with that penalty and, and pushing the Eagles back it was The first drop of the day by Nelson Aguilar. At this point, we're coming off the fourth quarter drop at the end of the game against the Falcons. So obviously, a lot of the fans don't have a great taste in their mouth when it comes to Nelson Aguilar. And then we get to a key third down play early in the game here, and he drops it once again. He runs a great out route. Wentz puts it right on the money. And he lets it get into his body, and then the defender comes in and knocks it right out of his hands. It's just certain things are becoming extremely frustrating for this football team and it's just when you don't have all your weapons and you're asking for other people to step up it's true that it's just do the basic things like we don't need you to be a superstar and make excellent plays we just need you to catch the football when Carson Wentz puts it on the money and we saw throughout the game that That was too much to ask, apparently, because seven drops by multiple receivers is completely unacceptable because I heard a stat coming into week three that I forget who it was, the Dolphins, they were second in the league in drops with seven combined in two weeks. Well, I don't know how many the Eagles had in the first couple weeks. It was more than one. So they got to be leading the league in this statistic now with seven more drops on Sunday. And this Aguilar drop wasn't even the biggest one of the game. Obviously, after the drop, the offense has to punt and gives the ball back to the Lions where the defense steps up, forces a punt back. But then when the offense gets the ball, Andre Dillard was in the game for Jason Peters, who was out due to an illness. He was questionable with an illness. Basically, that means he wasn't feeling great. Honestly, I think he was just a little bit dehydrated because it was a warm day here in Philadelphia. The temperature was in the high 80s, almost the 90s with the sun out. So on the field, it was probably warmer than that and we haven't had a day like that in quite some time so a big guy like that trying to keep his cool is uh is not the best combination but once they went into halftime he came out and played in the second half the announcer on the game said he probably got some ivs in the locker room and was able to catch up with some of his hydration and honestly i think he was spot on so they got him hydrated but um the reason i bring up andre dillard is because he actually got injured while filling in for jason peters 
It's still early in the week here, so we don't really have an update, but Dillard missed the rest of the game with a knee, and obviously I don't expect him to be back this Thursday, let alone the next couple of weeks. I think we're going to be without Dillard for the next month or so because you're going to be smart with your backup offensive tackle, and you're going to need him for the long term. So if it's any sort of a tweak or anything like that, I think the Eagles should be a little bit cautious in bringing him back too quickly. But like I said, obviously with Dillard out and JP having troubles, this meant Halapalute Vitae was in at left tackle. And I got to give kudos to Vitae because honestly, he does not perform that well when he comes in typically in the middle of a game and doesn't have that full week of practice with the starters to get in that rhythm and and really mentally prepare for what he's going against. And, And he did well for, you know, about a quarter. Like I said, JP came back in the second half, but Vitae stood out as as a positive in the second quarter when he was thrust in there, obviously, after these couple of injuries. But this drive obviously was not a great drive for the Eagles with the injury to Dillard, but Miles Sanders made it even worse. This was the drive where Miles Sanders fumbled not once, but twice on the same drive. The first fumble, the Eagles were able to recover and keep possession, and then they put in Jordan Howard for a couple of different snaps, and I thought it was interesting that they went right back to Miles Sanders. It shows you a little bit of a glimpse into the thinking of Doug Peterson and and really what he's looking at with these rookies and trying to groom them moving forward because he doesn't bury Miles Sanders on the depth chart. He goes right back to him and feeds him the rock again, and How does Miles Sanders respond? By putting it on the turf once again. And the second time, the Lions were able to recover. And then with the short field, they hit a reverse for 40 yards, which led to a field goal and put them up 17 to 10. So the defense picked up Miles Sanders and only held the Lions to a field goal. But it just gets back to this turnovers and special teams and and all of the little things that add up over the course of 60 minutes to whether or not a team is going to win or lose a football game. And For the first 30 minutes, yet again, the Eagles are doing everything they can to give this game to the Lions. After this field goal, that's when we had the kickoff return where Miles Sanders almost got decapitated, but somehow none of the officials saw this. I don't... I don't understand how in today's game, the the best officials, which apparently are what these NFL officials are, can miss calls such as this. We have all these issues with the pass interference and the holding, and holding can happen on every play. If you're on offense, you're probably holding on every play, and if you're on defense, you're definitely thinking you're, you're being held on every play, but... Helmets just don't pop off, Mr. Referee. When you're looking back and you see a guy's helmet five yards away from where his body is and the reaction of the crowd, that alone should let you throw a flag because regardless, you're going to run together and you're going to talk about it. And if somebody decides that everybody didn't see it, but the replay will play by then, you'll be able to look up and see the replay. It's just The NFL across the board has an officiating problem because we also had the instance, we'll talk a little bit more about it on this Sunday's episode, but Tom Brady tweets out during the Thursday night football game, just let the guys play and I can't turn it, I'm going to turn it off with all these different penalties. And when you have the face of the NFL and the greatest quarterback of all time tweeting out to the entire nation that he's turning off your product because of the officiating, that's certainly not a good look and definitely not what Roger Goodell is going for. And it's just another little tidbit between the Patriots and Goodell. So I actually kind of like that. But uh, the officials just missing calls once again. and, And just it's unacceptable at this point. But at the end of this drive, the Eagles continued the first half of horrors with uh, Aguilar's catch fumble incompletion, where apparently he had caught it, had enough time to turn up field, make a move, but uh, put it on the turf. The Lions ran it all the way back. The defense made a heck of a play to hold him to a three and out in a field goal where it was 20 to 10 at halftime. But here we are once again, down 10 at halftime. We have two fumbles. One special team's touchdown against us, and it's the same song and dance. We talked all week about how Doug Peterson's going to make adjustments and what's going to be different this game. And and the logical answers to that was, well, they're going to have a week of practice with everybody, and and they're going to be able to figure it out, and the Lions aren't very good. And 
we should have expected this because this is the way it's been for three weeks now. Even in their week one win against the Redskins, they were awful in the first half. And until they change that, there's no reason to think it's it's going to uh, be any different against the Packers this Thursday. But coming out of halftime, down 10, still feeling like you're okay because the offense really has been better and, and Carson's been playing good football. And the Lions get the ball first. They uh, The Eagles force a punt. We had our first challenge on a defensive pass interference, which ended up stands as non-pass interference, and, and I agreed with the call. But it was the first time we had seen that challenge in three weeks, and I thought we were going to see it more often, to be honest with you. So I was surprised that that was the, thirst, the first one we had seen, but I agreed with the call. The offense gets the ball back uh, with that drive stalls due to an offensive P.I. by Mac Hollins once again. But at this point, you're starting to realize that Mac Hollins is Carson Wentz go to guy with the receivers that they have available because Zach Ertz was being double teamed all day. And the other three receivers were be given man to man coverage. And yes, Aguilar got his 10, 12 targets. But on third downs and a lot of times when Wentz was scrambling and extending the play, it was Mac Hollins who he was looking to find. And it worked out, but uh, two offensive PIs against Mac really uh, held back what could have been a, a really strong day. Eagles punt the ball back, force a punt by the Lions on a short field. Then the Eagles get it back. And this was when they went down for the touchdown. Matt Collins, big third down conversion who we just spoke about. But Aguilar redeems himself once again. The roller coasters with this guy are just a little bit too much to take because he makes a heck of a play. He catches a crossing route from the 20-yard line, makes two or three guys miss by putting him through the spin cycle, back-to-back -back spins, and scores a touchdown. And he broke more more tackles on that play than Zach Ertz has broken in five years since he's been with the Eagles. It's just – it's really tough to, to stick with this guy because you'll get a heck of a play and then he just – won't make the routine play. And if he made the routine play with these crazy circus catches, then you're looking at an outstanding receiver. But just the frustration of the up and downs that go with Nelson Aguilar can start to wear on a fan. Once again, the Eagles defense played a heck of a football game, but during a key drive, gave up a touchdown to the Detroit Lions. I talked about it in the first quarter when the Eagles went up 10-7, the Lions came right back and scored a touchdown, and I thought this was the key drive of the second half. When the Eagles cut it to 20-17, to the Lions get the ball back and then beat a third down blitz on a great throw by Matt Stafford that only a few quarterbacks can make, but we knew Matt Stafford was one of them coming into this week. And then another time where they beat the blitz for a touchdown because we're not getting any pressure from our front four whatsoever. We have one sack from the front four and zero sacks from the defensive end all year. And as a team, they only have two sacks. We have one from a safety and one from a tackle, which is just unacceptable as a team that really predicates its defense on getting pressure from the front four. Because now Jim Schwartz has to blitz more, which he doesn't like to do, which puts your corners on an island and they haven't been able to cover. It's just it's a catch 22 right now for the Eagles defense. And I don't know if they're going to be able to get out of it here without making a move. Somehow they're going to have to come up with a pass rush because I don't know where it's coming from. We start the fourth quarter, as I said, 27-17 Lions, and back and forth with a couple of different three and outs, followed by the Eagles finally putting it together and then getting that touchdown drive going where Miles Sanders caught his second deep pass of the game. And then uh, this was the Dallas Goddard drop in the end zone where he was one-on-one -on -one with a linebacker and went through a perfect pass to him, but Goddard dropped it because he had his hands turned the wrong way. I don't know what he's thinking trying to catch it like he did. If you just turn and catch it like a basket catch over your shoulder, it's a touchdown every time. I don't I don't know if that's coaching or, or if that's just habitual or what he's doing there, but somebody's got to let him know to turn his hands and life's going to be a hell of a lot easier for him. He was picked up by the rest of the offense, though, and actually two Lions penalties really attributed to this as well. They had a, a rough in the passer and then a, a defenseless receiver personal foul call against him as well, which led to uh, Nelson Aguilar's second touchdown of the day. And with seven minutes left, the Eagles cut it to 27-24, where the Lions get the ball back. They get a couple of first downs, but force a punt, and the Eagles get it back with uh, about four minutes left, and 
three and out, four and out, turnover on downs. And I agree with Doug Peterson to go for it in that instance because you had all three of your timeouts in the two-minute warning, and if you held them to a field goal, you could still score a touchdown to win the game. And based on the way your defense was playing overall, I think you uh, you got to have faith in them to hold them to a field goal at that point, which is, in fact, exactly what happened. The defense, after the offense turned it over on downs, did a three and out, all their timeouts, and then this is where the blocked field goal came into play. And Malcolm Malcolm Jenkins said after the game they saw something on film where they knew they were going to have an opportunity to block a field goal and they were just waiting for the best opportunity to unleash this uh, field goal block and and they waited for the right time and Malcolm got it and then on the replay it shows that he runs into a guy and what was another ticky tack block in the back call because as a fan and a watcher when I first watched it I'm going okay we have it at the 25 we're already in field goal range worst case this game's tied and then we come back from commercial and we're on the 50 yard line and I'm going wait a minute what the heck happened so oh it's just another frustrating moment where you do good and then moments after words just something astronomically bad happens and it just seems to be what the Eagles are doing this year just a constant roller coaster of ups and downs but the offense gets the ball back with a chance to win the game Darren Sproles gets called for a pass interference offensive the third one which was probably the best one of the day but overall it's just come on guys what are we doing here three offensive pass interferences in one game I don't know if I see one a week let alone three on one team in one game. But after all of that, the last play, the last hurrah for the Eagles, fourth and 15, Wentz scrambles around, throws it up, and J.J. Ortega-Whiteside has an opportunity to come down with a 50-50 ball. And this is why they drafted him in the second round, because at Stanford he was excellent in these situations. And after you see the replay, it's just another stone-cold drop, just Another drop. It hit him right in the hands. People thought that the defender got his hands on the ball, and after seeing it, he didn't. He dropped it, and if he catches that, he falls backwards or turns around and walks his way into the end zone for an Eagles win. And and once again, Carson Wentz, people are looking at him going, what more can this guy do? He put it on the money in prime time again, and he was let down by his teammates. So when it's all said and done, 27-24 Lions, that's your final. The Eagles go to one and two. A lot of different issues on this team, as I mentioned throughout, but a few final thoughts to wrap up the week three game against the Lions. Ronald Darby was bad in the first half, and then he got hurt, so I don't think you're going to see him this Thursday. Maybe look for a roster move between now and them to add another corner because only dressing three corners, you're looking for trouble there. Uh, another first half deficit we talked about for the Eagles can't overcome, you know, once again being from behind and having to throw the ball mainly in the second half. Uh, the offensive line as the day went on, just not great overall. And it really led to uh, 43 pass plays called, 26 runs. Not the best distribution when it comes to play calling for Doug Peterson. Obviously, playing from behind dictates that. And, you know, the defense giving up those two key touchdown drives really lends it to being more of a pass-happy offense. But the Eagles' third straight loss overall to the Lions, last four of five, uh, we got some issues. But that's the end of the first segment. Coming into the second segment, we're actually going to do a brief segment uh, previewing the Green Bay Packers and what's going to be this Thursday's game because we talked about it on Sunday. But your Eagles actually play Thursday night football this week in Green Bay against Aaron Rodgers. So... Once again, this is Kevin Mahalik here at Usula Media and Usula Radio. I appreciate you guys listening. Head to Facebook, Instagram, Twitter. Follow both Too Close to Call, the number two both times, as well as Usula Media and Radio. That way you can stay up to date with everything that's going on out there, both with Usula and Too Close to Call. And we'll pause now for a brief break from one of our sponsors. But on the other side, we'll be talking the week four matchup between your Philadelphia Eagles and the Green Bay Packers. Hi, I'm Jay Farner, CEO of Quicken Loans. 30% of Americans who are planning home improvements of $5,000 or more will pay for those renovations with a high-interest credit card. That may not be a great idea. A better idea may be to take cash out of your home with a Quicken Loans 30-year fixed-rate mortgage. The rate today on our 30-year fixed-rate mortgage is 4.125%. APR, 4.22%. Call us today at 800-QUICKEN or go to rocketmortgage.com. Rate subject to change. 8.88% fee to receive this discounted rate. Call for cost information and conditions. Equal housing lender. License in all 50 states. NMLS number 33.
Welcome back, everybody, to Too Close to Call here at Usula Media and Usula Radio. It is Tuesday, September 24th, just about 1.30 in the afternoon. I hope everybody out there listening is having a great week so far as we're making our way through the work week. And uh, it's a special edition here at Too Close to Call because the Philadelphia Eagles actually play on Thursday night football this week. They travel uh, to Green Bay to face the Packers, who are 3-0, and coming off a win over the Denver Broncos and what was a convincing win for the Green Bay Packers. And everybody saw their opening night win over the Chicago Bears. It wasn't super impressive offensively, but with a rookie head coach and uh, a new system that Aaron Rodgers is learning for the first time in his career, he's been with Mike McCarthy previously for all, I think it was 10 years of his career. And He's adjusted okay so far because there have been some ups and downs. And honestly, it's something we haven't seen in the past. But the Packers, as we get into a little bit of a preview here of Green Bay, is uh, the defense has been carrying them this far. And they are greatly improved, which certainly makes sense because during the offseason, the Green Bay Packers put a ton of resources into the defense. They had two first round picks that they both invested into the defensive side of the football, taking Rashawn Gary out of Michigan with their first pick and then a safety later in the first round. They also signed a few different pass rushers as well as another safety. So they decided that if they're going to get back to their winning ways with Aaron Rodgers and I think it was 2010 or 11 when he was winning MVP and they won their Super Bowl. But uh, the defense is going to have to be greatly improved because Rodgers just can't carry this team anymore. In years past, they've had a horrible offensive line, a horrible defense, and Rodgers has still been able to get them to that 9-10 win mark and make the playoffs more often than not when he's healthy. But that's been another issue for them with the offensive line is keeping Aaron Rodgers healthy. But through three games, he seems to be protecting himself himself a little bit better than he has in the past and is making those quick throws that we've come accustomed to and and he does have a little bit of autonomy at the line still there there were some preseason conversations and concerns around the Packers about whether or not the new rookie head coach was going to allow Aaron Rodgers to audible out of his play calls or get to the line of scrimmage and make an adjustment that he sees fit and I think it only took a game or two for the coach to realize, but uh, you got to let Aaron Rodgers do his thing. This guy has obviously been at an MVP level before. He's been doing this for much longer than you've been coaching. And if he gets to the line of scrimmage and sees something that he wants to audible out of or put them into a uh, a better play in his eyes to have the best chance to succeed, uh, you're going to let him do that. And, and that's one of the concerns for the Eagles defense going into Green Bay. Obviously, the home field advantage for Green Bay will allow them to make all the checks and audibles at the line of scrimmage they need due to the uh, noise concern will not be there where they play in Philadelphia. And this leads to a little bit of an issue with me in the uh, the blitz packages that Jim Schwartz is going to have to put together. Because as we touched on last segment, the, uh, the Eagles have not been able to get any pass rush out of their front four, uh, which means they then have to blitz to get to the quarterback and Aaron Rodgers is another one if you just let him sit back there and scan the field and make decisions he's going to embarrass you so you need to get after it with him and make him uncomfortable in the pocket and yes he does uh, improvise extremely well which is why you got to maintain discipline in your pass rushing lanes and you can't allow him to get out of the pocket especially if you do blitz and go man to man he can hurt you with the quarterback run if they send everybody deep the defensive backs will have their backs turned and they'll be uh, unable to see him scramble and they could give up a few big plays that way but uh, overall the Eagles defense is going to have to step up even more in this game because as I was touching on the Packers defense being greatly improved a few stats jumped out at me and the fact that the Packers defense has only allowed four touchdowns in three games for an NFC low 11.7 points per game. And once again, this is not normal for Green Bay. So the fact that they're putting up these types of defensive numbers is is really taking a page out of the Chicago Bears playbook in the division and winning with defense. And 
the fact that the Eagles are coming in here with all these players still banged up, I, I know it's Tuesday, and everybody saw the uh, injury list that came out Monday. We don't know what it looks like yet here on Tuesday, but uh, educated guesses thinking that Deshaun Jackson is still going to miss this game, and they're holding out uh, hope that Alshon Jeffrey will be able to bounce back and give them uh, some solid minutes, even if it's 8, 10, 12 snaps, kind of similar to Goddard in the second half of last week, because he'll be another one that will warm up and, and should be able to suit up and dress. But none of these guys at full strength on a short week, traveling to Green Bay, tough place to play. They're not going to get much practice time in this week because it's already Tuesday. They didn't practice yesterday. They're not going to practice today. They're going to travel tomorrow, probably have a walkthrough. So they're going to be going off of something very similar to last week's game plan, or at least timing wise, they're not going to have any opportunities to make adjustments or changes to what they saw happening against the Lions. And all of this leads me to believe that things are not shaping up in the Eagles' favor for this game. And as a Philadelphia fan, it's kind of a funny little scenario because the Eagles tend to keep us on our toes. And I got a few text messages from some friends after the Lions game that said, as bad as we played here, this is going to piss people off and the Eagles are going to bounce back and we're going to beat the Packers. And I applaud their uh, their positivity and optimism, but unfortunately... I don't think I'm going to be jumping on that bandwagon for this game. I thought uh, week two in Atlanta was the game out of the first four that they were going to have to get. Uh, everybody penciled in the Lions game as a win. Obviously, that's when they were all healthy. But Atlanta, we knew was going to be a tough game either way and Green Bay as well. And with these injuries, it, it's really added to the, the toughness of the early season schedule. And the odds makers are, are agreeing with myself, putting the Eagles at plus four to begin the week. And honestly, I thought that was a little bit low. I thought the line should have been up to five and a half, six, six and a half, something like that. Uh, maybe they're still holding out that Alshon's going to play because I know last week the line dropped from Eagles minus seven to Eagles minus four when the news came that Alshon wasn't going to play. So Alshon being worth a field goal makes me think that when we get closer to kickoff, you're going to have Eagles plus six, six and a half. And I honestly think the Packers are still in a, a good situation to to uh, take advantage of what's going on because in their last eight home games, Green Bay is six and two straight up and uh, four and one against the spread in their last five games. So definitely some uh, factors pointing in their way, as well as the factors are four and one against the spread in their last five NFC East games. They're 5-1 and one against the spread in their last six games played in the month of September. Green Bay has won 5 of 6 straight up against the Eagles and are 5-2 and two in their last seven straight up when they play at Lambeau Field. And that's what I'm saying. You, you just look at a lot of these statistics and odds and, and what what's going on out there, and none of it is spelling confidence for the Philadelphia Eagles. I, this year, the Packers, I said they're 3-0, and where they're 3-0 and against the spread as well, and the Eagles are 0-3 against the spread, and a lot of different things are, are out there that make me think that the Packers are actually going to have a relatively easy victory when it comes to this Thursday night, and and then one in three is a problem for your Eagles. I, I did some digging around to look into the differences between being two and two or one and three to start the year. And uh, it's a pretty important difference here as I um, pull up some of the stats I was reading and, and we'll look into the difference here. We'll go back. So the last three times the Eagles started a year two and two. So the last four times the Eagles started the year two and two, 2018, just last year, finished nine and seven, lost in the divisional round. Next, you have to go all the way back to 2010, where they finished 10 and six, lost in the wild card round. Then 2008, finished nine, six and one, lost in the NFC championship game. And then 2003, 12 and four, lost in the NFC championship game. So, as you've seen, the last four times this team was two and two, they actually bounced back and, and finished strong to make the playoffs. And that's something I want to remind you fans out there as well. If you look at the Eagles' schedule, 
the last five games are all winnable football games. You have the Dolphins and then your four divisional teams. So even if they lose to Dallas, they're going to finish four and one down the stretch in December. So don't get too distraught if they do go to one and three, because the back end of the schedule is as easy as the front end of the schedule was tough. And hopefully they'll be getting back a few different pieces by then to uh, be a little bit healthier on the tail end. However, though, the history of the Eagles starting one and three, not great. That's for dang sure. So 2015 finished seven and nine, missed the playoffs. They did have that one year in 2013. They actually started one and three and finished 10 and six. So went nine and three down the stretch where they lost in the wild card game. I believe that was the game with Foles and the Saints and Chip Kelly's first year. But the two times before that, 2011, 2007, both started one and three, both finished eight and eight. Missed the playoffs both years. So as you see, three out of the four times, or here we go, even if you go a little bit further, four out of the last five times they've started one and three. They've missed the playoffs. And the last seven times they've started two and two, they actually made the playoffs. So look at that. You know, four out of five, one and three. People so people talk about oh and two kind of being the mark where it's difficult to come back from. But I would argue that it's one in three where, you know, you really, because you're a quarter of the way in at that point, you really start to see who you are as a team. And uh, it's tough to bounce back because if you go 10 and six and you're one and three, you got to go nine and three over the last three months. Now, I did just tell you the Eagles are going to finish four and one. So that means they would have to go five and two over the rest of their games, which is difficult to do, but not out of the question. So uh, don't totally bail if the Eagles falter this Thursday in Green Bay. Personally, I'm taking the Packers. I think it's going to be something along the lines of 23-13 or 27-17. I'm taking the Packers to win by, you know, a little bit over a touchdown because I just don't think the Eagles offense is going to be able to get anything going out in Green Bay on a short week with all of these pieces missing. We saw them struggle against the Falcons. We saw them struggle against the Lions. And honestly, I think Green Bay's defense is better than both of those teams. We got a short week. We're traveling. So a lot of the variables just don't add up. I think the Eagles defense plays good enough, but ultimately gives up uh, 23, 27 points because we all know somebody's going to fumble or there's going to be a drop because you have to assume it's going to happen because that's all we've seen for the first three weeks of the season. But uh, that's my preview of the Eagles Packers game. Let me know what you guys think is going to happen out there in the comments here on Usula Media, Usula Radio, as well as Too Close to Call. Head to all the social media pages one more time. If you guys haven't already, give us a like, a follow. Please subscribe. It does a heck of a lot for both Usula and Too Close to Call. We appreciate you guys sticking with us out there, listening, and uh, we're going to have one more segment on the back end where we're going to talk Philadelphia Phillies because baseball season's wrapping up, coming to an end here, and we're going to have playoffs to talk about, but not Philadelphia Phillies playoff baseball, unfortunately, for the, I think it's eighth straight year now. So uh, hang with us, guys, here after a, a brief word from our sponsors. We'll be back on the tail end to talk a little bit of baseball. Hi, I'm Jay Farner, CEO of Quicken Loans. 30% of Americans who are planning home improvements of $5,000 or more will pay for those renovations with a high-interest credit card. That may not be a great idea. A better idea may be to take cash out of your home with a Quicken Loans 30-year fixed-rate mortgage. The rate today on our 30-year fixed-rate mortgage is 4.125%, APR 4.22%. Call us today at 800-QUICKEN or go to rocketmortgage.com. Rate subject to change. 8.88% fee to receive this discounted rate. Call for cost information and conditions. Equal housing lender. License in all 50 states. NMLS number 3030. Welcome back, everybody, to the third and final segment of Too Close to Call here at Usula Radio and Usula Media. I appreciate you guys listening. If you've been with us for the entire 40 or 45 minutes or so, thank you very much for listening. But do me a favor one more time. If you haven't already, head to social media, head to Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, 
follow Usula Media and Usula Radio, that's U-S-A-L-A Media and Radio, as well as Too Close to Call. That's the number two both times. And also go to Apple Podcasts, Google Play, wherever you listen to your podcasts, and subscribe to Too Close to Call, where you can get this audio on demand at any time, as well as previous episodes and additional episodes that Too Close to Call myself does on the side outside of our radio show here three times a week on Usula Radio. And I appreciate everything you guys do out there. You can rate the podcast, review, leave a comment on any of our posts, any of the pages. We do read all the comments, myself, everyone here at Usula Media and Radio, and we appreciate you guys interacting with the show as we do it for you, the fans, and I'm always looking to hear for feedback on the show, what you guys are looking for, what you want to listen to. So reach out and let me know. Message me. Like I said, leave a comment and uh, we'll we'll make some changes and, and get better for you guys listening out there. But speaking about making some changes, the Philadelphia Phillies are going to have to make quite a few changes during this offseason because here we are, September 24th. The Phillies are currently 79 and 76, six and a half games out of the wild card spot with their tragic number being one game. And I say tragic number because people talk about the magic number to clinch, which for all of you who don't know out there essentially means the total combination of wins by your team and losses by the team that's behind you. Well, in this case, the tragic number is losses for the Phillies and or wins by the Brewers or Nationals, who they're chasing in the wild card. And with the magic number down to one, the Phillies will probably be eliminated by the time tomorrow comes around. And it's another year without playoff baseball here in Philadelphia. We haven't been to the playoffs since 2011, and the Phillies need to go 3-4 and four over their last seven games to secure a winning record for the first time since 2011. They went 81-81 81 and 81 in 2012, but haven't been over 500 in almost eight years. So for the front office, the coaching staff, and everybody involved with the Phillies, they'll try to sell you on a... A uh, rebound and improvement from last year, which if they finish right around 500 like they've been all year is, is right where they're going to end up. But honestly, as a fan and somebody who follows the Phillies and a diehard, it's not good enough. The Phillies told us last offseason that they were going to spend stupid money. Now, I don't think they did that. Obviously, they spent $330 million on Bryce Harper, which after the course of a year, has actually turned out to be a, a good signing. And the people who were saying Harper was a disappointment early, he's bounced back and continued to play throughout the year and, and really showed you guys that he's having himself another solid year. He's up to 33 home runs, 108 RBIs, and with seven games left, he's looking to get to 35 and 110 which you would absolutely sign up for this past offseason if you said you were going to get 35 and 110 out of Harper. You were definitely going to take that. But it's the guys around Harper who have been a little bit of a disappointment. The The other uh, trade piece not signing from the past offseason that's actually lived up to expectations is JT Real Muto. He's had a tremendous second half and put his average all the way up to 275. He's got 25 home runs, 83 RBIs, and he's going to be one of the biggest priorities of the offseason. I think it's time to extend JT Rio Muto, keep him while he's in his prime. He's been saying all the right things in the media that he wants to be here. He sees a quality future for the Philadelphia Phillies. So it's just a matter of term and dollars at this point. And honestly, I think you're going to have to pay him upwards of the annual value that Bryce Harper is getting a year. And the best catcher in baseball, I just read his offensive statistics, and he's been even better defensively. He's throwing out the most attempted base stealers by a mile when it comes to his next competition and the number of base stealers being thrown out. He's also been tremendous behind the plate calling pitches, and he's played pretty much every game. And that parlays into the next uh, roster upgrade that nobody's really talking about, but the Phillies are definitely going to have to look into, and that's upgrading backup catcher. I'm sorry, but Andrew Knapp is just not good enough anymore. And I know they have a guy who they called up here in September. He was playing in Lehigh Valley. His name is Gillion, I believe is how you pronounce it. And he could be the one in 
internal candidate to push Andrew Knapp next year. But I think this is where you're going to have to look on the market and, and find yourself um, some value in the margins, the Phillies like to say, and all the analytics people talk about is finding those players that aren't going to cost you a lot of money, but ultimately bring you wins and that's one thing Matt Klentak has been good at this season. I will say that. The in-season acquisitions, he he did not do anything at the trade deadline, which we spoke about in length and really basically spoke to the team that they weren't going to make any moves and, and kind of gave up on him. But uh, the additions of Jay Bruce, until he got hurt, he was going to be a bench bat, was thrust into an everyday role. He'll be back next year. Uh, the additions and the pitching staff of Mike Morin, Blake Parker, and all those gentlemen – They've been okay. Obviously, they're not going to be back next year. They're not names you're going to want in your bullpen when you're trying to secure a playoff spot down the stretch, as we've seen here in 2019. But um, Corey Dickerson was a good addition, and you've just seen why he was available, because he just can't stay healthy. He, he obviously can hit. He's a professional hitter. He hit over 300 again. He was breaking or tying Reese Hoskins' records with – the most RBIs and the fewest amount of games. I think he had 35 RBIs and 35 games. And it's just a matter of playing Jenga with these outfield pieces because how far away are these kids or how much do you believe in these kids moving forward? Because you're going to have Andrew McCutcheon back, who was one of the big injuries this year. And we really saw the team kind of tank and become a 500, a little bit under 500 team once he's out of the lineup. But uh, Adam Hazley has been okay, a little more solid. Uh, people in the news and the media are higher on Adam Hazley than I am just because of the fact that uh, the kid's five for 45 on breaking balls. So there was a time where he didn't even have a hit on a breaking ball. Now, he's upped his average to 118 or 111, whatever the heck it breaks down to. But either way, people are going to see this and notice this over the offseason. And even if he's hitting seventh or eighth next year, he's going to see a steady diet of breaking balls until he can make an adjustment and prove he can hit those. And you also have Corey Dickerson. Do you bring him back to play because he's a good piece? Bryce Harper is obviously out there. Odubel Herrera still on the roster. I know people haven't said that name because the assumption is he will be cut or traded, but he'll have no value and be able to come back next year. As well as you have the kids in the minors. You got Mickey Moniak, who's pretty close knocking on the door, and a few other gentlemen at AA and AAA who may be available. So it's going to be another decision of, do you trust the kids to continue their development and get better, or do you go out there and sign a veteran piece, maybe as insurance if you get another injury or, or a depth piece? But I like Jay Bruce as a fourth outfielder, a bat off the bench. Obviously, Harper is going to be in right. You would think McCutcheon is in left. So it basically comes down to Hazley in center with Moniak potentially as that fourth or fifth guy because I think he needs to be added to the 40-man roster at the very least to avoid that Rule 5 draft coming up here shortly. But those are only a few of the questions that the front office and coaching staff's going to have to answer. And they have more in the infield. Obviously, you got Reese Hoskins at first base. Uh, Gene Segura has been a little bit of a disappointment at shortstop. He has a... Uh, uh, career high in errors. I think he's got 20 errors this year. He's been hurt a couple of times. He uh, His average will be under 300 for the first time in five to seven years. So is this the start of the decline of Gene, or is it too early to move on yet? Because I believe they have two more years of team control with him. But at third base, Michael Franco, we all know he's not going to be back. And the question is, do you think Scott Kingery can play third base every day, or do you go out and sign one of these big free agents. Anthony Rendon is the big name on the market, but how many years do you want Anthony Rendon? Because your former first round pick who played at three levels this year and finished a double A and is maybe one year away, depending on results, but Alec Baum, your third baseman of the future. However, some of the scouting reports don't think that he can play third base at the major league level. So do you move him to the outfield or first base? Because you're going to sign Rendon to five or seven years. Or do you look at a guy like Josh Donaldson or Mike Moustakis as a one-year stopgap option? You give Baum an entire another year in the minors because you have uh, Donaldson playing third base. And 
Cesar Hernandez at second. Is is he a full-time second baseman? He's going to lead the team in hitting once again this year. He just continues to be a solid major league player. He's shown some pop from the left side of the plate. I know he's still switch hitting, and uh, I don't think he has a single home run right-handed. He has all 10 of them lefty, but he's shown that he's a serviceable MLB player. And Reese Hoskins at first base, he's honestly been – Probably one of the main reasons outside of the pitching staff on why the Phillies are going to miss the playoffs because post All-Star break, Reese Hoskins is only hitting 185 with nine home runs and 24 RBIs. And the murmurs are starting on social media about whether or not it's time to move on from Reese Hoskins. And I don't think we're there yet because unfortunately, I think you would be selling low at this point and With an offseason and some mechanical changes, I do think that there is a good hitter in there somewhere, you know, maybe 250, 260. He's probably not going to be an average guy, but I do think there's 35 and 100 similar to Bryce Harper in there somewhere. And if we get the correct coaching staff in the building, I think they're going to be able to bring that out of Reese and turn him back into a solid player. But Those are your issues on the position side of things. Obviously, the pitching staff is a huge concern in its own right, with Aaron Nola being the only gentleman coming back next year. And the concern with Nola is, for the second straight year, September Nola has been awful. This year, he's 0-2 with a 6-1-4 ERA in four games, and this is when we needed him the most. I I remember having conversations saying that we're not going to be able to lose another Aaron Nola start because the other starting pitchers haven't been good enough. Well, since I've said that, they're 0-5 in Aaron Nola starts and 11-5 in everybody else's starts. It's, It's unbelievable. Just they keep finding ways to lose and miss the playoffs. And Oh, it's so frustrating as a fan, but it's clear that the pitching staff is nowhere near good enough going into next year, and it's going to be a question of if the Phillies are willing to spend stupid money once again, because the top couple of names on the market for starting pitchers are Garrett Cole, the uh, probable Cy Young winner out of Houston, but he's going to get a contract upwards of $200 million at $25, $30 million a year, probably $30 million plus per year, but you also have Madison Bumgardner, Cole Hamill. Jake Odorizzi available that may be a little bit more cost effective, but the Phillies, I think, need two of these guys because you look at the starting rotation. Yes, you have Nola. Arietta will be back on his last year of the contract, but that's really all you have. I know you can bring back Vargas cheap on an option. You have all the kids back once again, but in my eyes, we're looking at three to four rotation spots that are going to be available. So I look for the Phillies, obviously, to spend the money on Garrett Cole and then potentially look to bring in a Cole Hamels-like pitcher uh, on a shorter-term deal because they're going to have the money to spend. But uh, another year of missing the playoffs is going to be unacceptable. And I think this offseason, the the Phillies have to move on from Gabe Kapler. Uh, Matt Klentak, in my personal opinion, is a little bit more to blame than Gabe is. However, it's typically the manager that takes the falls for these types of seasons because you're not going to, you know, clean house and, and get rid of everybody. And like I just said, with a recent extension, that means that Kapler is more of a uh, lame duck than Klintak. But they're going to have to do something this offseason. It's going to be the biggest offseason in team history. Uh, we said that last year, and I think the Phillies still had a good offseason. But obviously, we saw it wasn't enough. And this team had more holes than we thought it did going into the year. And, and a few moves were not going to be enough to get it done. But By the time next Tuesday rolls around, the Phillies season will officially be over. We'll be starting our transition into the uh, winter sports, such as hockey and basketball. But another year without Phillies playoffs here in Philadelphia. We're coming up closer to a decade with that. And uh, something's got to change because I I just need October baseball in my life. But uh, that's this week's episode of Too Close to Call here on Usula Media and Usula Radio. I know I've asked you guys to follow us on social media. If you have haven't yet, please do so. Obviously, that's huge for spreading the word here, getting the word out about Usula and Too Close to Call. So I appreciate you guys listening as always here on a beautiful Tuesday afternoon, September 24th. I hope you have a great rest of your week and I look forward to uh, talking to you guys this weekend about football once again. So enjoy the rest of the week out there and I'll uh, talk to you guys again soon. Peace. Peace.